Today is January 13th, 1975, and I'm interviewing uh, Anne Borden. Uh, would you like to start off with a statement, and then we can go on from there? Well, the statement that I started to make before, which in essence is a, probably a very simple one, that um, there wasn't any one group any one group uh, professionally that had the edge. People did a good job or didn't do a good job, a uh, sensitive job, a, an inferior one, purely in terms of the kind of human beings that they were and how they related to the emergency of that moment. Uh, I would certainly say in my total experience with the problem uh, that uh, there wasn't any one group that did any better than any other group. There were um, superb people that came from nowhere and did a spectacular job. Uh, there were trained social workers who did a miserable job and uh, returned to the States within a few months or remained on and did a very uh, uh, mediocre uh, job, and I would certainly say that in terms of the chaplains, uh, there were some, as men, who did a superb job. There were some who were committed, who did a marvelous job. There were others who did a very, again, a very mediocre, inferior job. I don't think, by virtue of the fact that they happened to have been trained uh, in the rabbinate, gave them the edge or made them any superior workers. Uh, and I, I think that that's really all that, that the whole thing amounts to. I think that I would agree totally with everything you said. Um, in fact, if anything, that what I, what I have, my impressions or what, I'm, what I've learned so far from these discussions is that <coughs> you have a man like uh, Rabbi Klausner and others who took the initiative. Mm -hmm. But that was rare. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have um, other rabbis who saw a situation where they felt that they could do something, and they did it. Uh, they got food, packages, whatever, they did it. Uh, sometimes they had to be prodded, whether it was by the refugees, the DPs, or let's say Palestinians who came to them and said, look, Rabbi, can you do this, can you do that for me? Mm -hmm. They always uh, placed themselves as being, um, doing whatever they, what, not whatever they could, but they minimized their contribution. That may have been a realistic appraisal of what mm -hmm. they did, but they never went out of their way to suggest that I won the war, um, I saved hundreds of people, um, I was fantastic. If anything, the chaplains were, were not prepared for the job that, that, that they saw the, that was not their function. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would say in that a generalization that I don't think anyone, but anyone was prepared for the job because it was a job that had no relation to anything that any human being had ever experienced before. Yeah. Uh, and because of the uh, uniqueness of the situation, because it was so horrendous, because there were no guidelines, because it was something that no one had ever experienced before, people reacted in terms of their own capabilities. Uh, there were those that were more courageous, uh, those that were more imaginative, uh, those who had more initiative, uh, those who were able to see the uh, uh, bigger aspects of it who did a better job. There were those that were meeker, more frightened, more accustomed from their training uh, in whatever job that they had held before, where they had to follow instructions, where they had never been trained or had never thought in terms of taking initiative on their own, who just uh, uh, collapsed on the job, not out of being inferior people, but because they simply weren't up to uh, meeting the unusualness of the situation. You had to go out, certainly at the beginning, uh, and you had to, what we call, organize food, which meant that you had to, if necessary, steal it. Uh, you had to find it. You had to get it from somewhere. Well, you were either the kind of person who was able to, one way or another, 
get the cars or get the trains moving or get the foods or get the blankets or get the medical help or do whatever had to be done because it just had to be done. You didn't know how you were going to do it. There wasn't anybody there to tell you, this is how you should do it, this you should do and this you should. So you just went out and did it. Uh, but certainly uh, uh, the chaplains as a group were no better, no worse, uh, no more competent, no less competent than any other group of people. It just happened that maybe because of uh, uh, that this professional grouping maybe had more of them available. Although I'm not even sure that there were more chaplains than there were, I don't know what, social workers or, or uh, there were certainly at the beginning very, very few JDC workers. There were just a tiny handful of us. Mm -hmm. uh, now, someone, and we mentioned Rabbi Klausner, uh, it's within the nature of that particular person, someone like a Rabbi Klausner, uh, had he gone into uh, teaching or into medicine or into law or into dentistry, uh, would have been exactly the same kind of person. It's within his psyche. Mm -hmm. And he is the person who, of... Uh, uh, from within his own makeup, would fight the establishment. He is always against the establishment. He happens to be uh, a very superb organizer. He is very imaginative, he's creative, and he's able to get things done, as he was able in Yonkers to take over a little tiny, beat up, broken down temple that nobody else wanted and he was able to step into it and make it into a uh, growing, very successful, very good um, uh, movement so that he would react the same way, but he would have done exactly the same kind of job had he been just a, a GI from left field who happened to find himself there at that moment. I think that the only advantage the chaplain did have was that first of all every chaplain was an officer he wasn't just a gi he just wasn't an ordinary guy he began with the advantage of already being an officer <coughs> which as you can say is already uh fred having been an officer can verify the fact that you already begin with an enormous advantage uh the other advantage is that they were able to get entree because um let's say the commanding officer or the commanding general or whoever was in charge of a specific area where they could uh, not uh, listen to an ordinary worker or a GI or someone else that walked in was not as likely to turn a chaplain away. Uh, there is that additional edge because it has the name the word rabbi or minister or what have you attached to it. And the army does seem to, to uh, attach a great deal of reverence. No, tremendous. To, tremendous uh, reverence. To, uh, to a chaplain. Yeah. Right. So that they were able to get away with more. They were able to uh, perhaps get uh, uh, more entree, to get the ear of someone. Uh, but again, whether they got the ear of someone, whether they were willing to go out and stick their neck out, was not dependent upon their being a chaplain, but rather on the kind of human being that they were. Yeah, but I, I think we have to point out the fact that we are dealing with certain people um, who happen to be chaplains, but just like uh, we, we deal with people who are Jews. These people might, if they had been Catholics, uh, done the same type of thing. Right, exactly. Well, right, but I think we have to categorize them as chaplains because they were functioning in that position at that time. Not as chaplains, I would say well, they were that chaplains. they were functioning, though, as, for example, a, um, let's use Klausner as a working example, uh, he wasn't functioning as a chaplain, he was functioning as a Jew who happened to be in the midst of a situation that desperately needed help. And his primary concern was to do what he could about that given situation. The fact that he was a chaplain, or someone like uh, Gene Lippmann, who did a great job, the fact that Gene Lippmann happened to be a chaplain, I think, was absolutely secondary. I think that yeah, yeah, please, yes. the I mean, people I, I, who I did know these people and I don't see know. the right, people right. who did a good job, like and I'm yeah. like a Gene right, Lippmann, yeah. who did a very, very good job, did a very good job 
so in spite of their... Just that. speak louder. Uh, not only in, in spite of, but the fact is that they did a good job because they did not act as chaplains were supposed to act in an organized way. No That's a good it. point. Closet, That's a very good point. He went far beyond the, what a legitimate, um, um, organized, structured chaplain would dare do. Oh, there's no question about right. that. So they didn't do it as story. a chaplain, though. See, well, as a chaplain, he wouldn't have done it. If he had see, done a good the, and Fred, it's a very, very <laughs> valid point, and I would say you're probably putting your finger on what I was trying to say. Because I saw this. In the yeah, well, this is the had they, that we're saying. Now, had they acted as chaplains, they would have done half being aware of this. the fact that they were trained in the rabbinate and uh, that they had uh, religious obligations and that they were there to perform certain religious rites and acts and administer to the people, I think that they would have been failures. I think those who were successful were acting as they went, men. They went beyond the bounds of their jobs. Completely okay. beyond the uh, bounds. They were acting yes, as men right. who were in a situation that needed their help and they did whatever they could the best well, way they knew how to do it. You know that in Pirkei Avot there's a saying, in yeah. in a place where there are no men, it's your responsibility to strive to be men. That it's a rabbinical injunction. That, um, but it's but it's a rabbinical injunction, but you would carry it a step further. It's a human injunction. No question. And about. it's the people who were successful in the job were the people who did exactly that. Now I came to the job, no prior training in the field whatsoever. I got the job purely, purely by accident because I was en route somewhere else. I happened to have met. Uh, Paul Bayerwald, who happened to be chairman of the Joint Distribution Committee, who happened to see me, who said, what the hell are you planning to go to China for? We need you in Europe. The war is going to be over any day. Come to Europe. JDC. I'd never heard the word JDC before. I said, fine. And within a day later, I was on a boat going to Europe. Now, on the other hand, that's exactly how it happened. There isn't any exaggeration. As a matter of fact, this letter that Fred just mentioned, he mentioned we got a letter from San Francisco, from Berkeley. The <coughs> gal who wrote this letter to us is the one who was responsible for my going Paul to Europe. Uh, she happened to be Paul Bayerwald's niece. You still talk to her. Uh, we're very close friends. <laughs> and it happened that I met her again quite by accident in New York. And she said, come with me. I have to have tea with my uncle. It'll only take a few minutes, and then we'll be free and go on to do what we want. So I went up with her to meet her uncle to have tea with him for 10 minutes. And that's how I ended up in Europe. So uh, now my reaction to that job uh, was in the same way as I tackle any job that I have. And you're a witness to that. Yeah. When I get a job, important oh, or unimportant, oh, yeah. uh, and certainly the job I'm doing now couldn't be less important in the frame of all that's going on in the country today. And yet I tackle it with a tremendous amount of verve and energy, because that just happens to be the kind of person I am. I and because I will automatically, and have always all my life, fought the establishment, I this obviously went on fighting it there too. I have no had no qualms about going out if need be and stealing 200 blankets if it meant covering 200 Jews. But I would have done that same thing if it meant covering 200 anybody. Mm -hmm. I happened to be there at that moment and involved with Jews as a Jew. And you weren't a chaplain. And I wasn't a chaplain. <laughs> but do you know that I'm positive in meeting you just in these few minutes that if you had been there, you would have done the same thing. Now, I don't think you would have no, done it. No. See, Fred couldn't have. Fred would have been totally incapable, even though he's a beautiful human being. He would have been totally have been incapable of functioning in that that's situation. Right, he right. just couldn't have handled it. He would have fallen to pieces. That's right. Couldn't have done it. Now, Fred as a chaplain, and myself, let us say, if I were a chaplain, you would have had two entirely different right. reactions just because we're entirely different human beings. Fred couldn't have done it. No, you couldn't have gotten in and done the things that I did on the border. You just couldn't have done it. No, that's true. And I can tell you, I know any number of uh, superb women, women who have certainly made it, or women whose names are nationally or internationally recognizable, who could not have done what I did, where no one knows my name, because of the different kind of people we are. Can you imagine no, Bess, for example, functioning, Bess Meyerson. No, no. Now, there's a great woman. She would have gone to pieces. No. 
It's a personality <laughs> thing. Right. It's, it's a personality yeah. thing, and I think this is what's missed and what I was trying to get a whole across with Abe Hyman when we talked about Bricha. There was no magic in the word, in the name Bricha, because the Bricha, too, was made up of human beings. And it's, I think it's, uh, it's that simple, because certainly you're training as a rabbi. There's nothing within the training uh, that uh, uh, prepares you for a rescue job, which at least in the early days, now it did change tremendously as years went on. Uh, what happened in 46 was already different than 45, 47 was different than 46, 48 different than 47, because the, the, the situation kept stabilizing. The needs were different, their basic needs were already met. As time went on, the people settled in. You were dealing with immigration, you were dealing on an entirely different governmental, uh, entirely different level. <coughs> uh, it's really, uh, it's really people. Fine, but I think you see, the kind of job that you could have done, for example, which at the point at which I would have lost interest, yours would have been aroused. Likewise. Later on, where oh. it became a political oh, situation and where you had to work in terms of political and, forces, and yeah. political forces and working on immigration and working on visas and the thing became much more stabilized and you entirely different skills were needed later on. I can also visualize, I don't have it documented, I can visualize where the rabbi who was completely unsuccessful in 45-46 uh, might have been highly successful in 1950. Well, we have because no way of doing that because they didn't come back. Different people, huh? You yeah, see, yeah. because you yeah. needed different skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think for the record we should just mention the uh, with what organization you were affiliated and during what years? Joint distribution committee. And when did you work? 45, 6, 7, 8. In 1948, 49, I was in Israel with the Weizmann Institute. Now, uh, before we And get then to, after yeah. that, with uh, UJA in the United States, and then several years on national lecture. And mm -hmm. you also might want to mention the fact that you were. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I was with Pi I was executive director of Pioneer Women of America, oh, yeah. the yeah. American arm of Maud Sata Paul Lott. That's, that yeah. that's an important one. Yes. Of course it is. <coughs> now, um, that's all so far back, yeah, I couldn't I even. Know. Beyond that, you don't need my resume, I'm sure. <laughs> well. In writing, we'll get it the next time. <laughs> Where and when and uh, under what circumstances did you first come in professional contact with a, uh, an American Jewish chaplain with regard to the question of the remnants of the European Jews? Uh, within literally, not figuratively, literally five minutes after I got to Germany because the first person whom I the met, person. the first person whom I met when I got into passing in Germany, which is uh, was the first point prior to going up to Munich was Rabbi Klausner. Do you remember when that was? May of 45. May of 45. Now, uh, when did you first deal with the question of the remnants? What was the first question that confronted you? When did you, did you ever work with the chaplain in terms of uh, getting material, helping out? Uh, I don't think I'm ever able to answer that question because I had no awareness uh, of who was a chaplain or who was a... Well, they wore, they wore uniforms. Certainly no awareness of it at that time. They were people uh, digging in and doing the job that needed doing. What a person's prior or what a person's professional affiliations were or weren't in no way entered, certainly entered my consciousness. Okay. Now we know that you knew Rabbi Klausner. What can you tell me about his experience with you? Did you ever work together in any way? Oh, very, very closely. Fine. I would say that certainly he was... Do you remember a specific instance? I'm not sure that I can relate to that. Um, in other words, what it I'm trying... It isn't specific. It was, 
uh, Rabbi Klausner at that time in Germany, uh, now let me qualify that, not in Germany, yeah. but in the American zone, in the Munich area, uh, was certainly the dominant factor, the dominant force. And Rabbi Klausner was the one who uh, spent a lot of time talking to me, who certainly gave me whatever, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Orientation. Orientation. Uh, Rabbi Klausner was the one that took me to uh, the various camps. Uh, but not as a rabbi, but as a worker who was very happy to have another hand available and who was responsive to the fact that he had somebody who was uh, willing to work. Uh, and my response to him was only, here was somebody who was working who, who, with whom I could work and get a lot done. There wasn't any, uh, there was no um, feeling of this is a, a rabbi, this is a chaplain that happens to have the edge or no more. He knew more only because he was there longer and already um, uh, was familiar with the situation. Fine, but do you remember um, situations where you may have worked together to improve the situation there? Well, that's all we did. I can't... Uh, well, I mean, do you remember uh, going out and holding up a train or, or something to that effect? I mean, uh, in other words, what I'm trying to do is get specific instances, uh, experiences where you, experiences and did where you were involved right. in certain uh, problems. You mean specifically with this one person? Well, first we'll get, we'll finish with him, then maybe with I other I think I'd topics. find it terribly hard to specify a specific incident. I would say that certainly when uh, Abe wanted a difficult job done or a tricky job done, he turned to me to do it uh, only because he knew that somehow, one way or another, uh, I would at least give it as good a try as possible. Uh, as for example, uh, and this is later in terms of time, uh, it was, uh, there was a moment when there was a tremendous need for a, or it was felt that there was a need for a Jewish, specifically Jewish hospital oh, okay. in Munich. And, um, the people in Munich at JDC headquarters in Munich and by that time there was already headquarters and there was already a, a, a sizable staff uh, had made every attempt to get a Jewish hospital and had not been able to had been blocked by um, uh, American administration or military administration had not been able to get the release of a specific... Which year are we talking about? When did I get that hospital? I would say this was um, maybe January of 46. Okay. This was another hospital that he was involved with getting? I know three he was involved with. This is another one? Maybe it's one of the three. Which ones did he uh, refer to? St. Petersburg. No, this was not St. No. And the other one, I don't Well, the other one is the third one is the one that I'm talking about. Oh, okay. uh, St. Attilian and Gouting were at the very, the very, 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 very beginning. beginning. Right. So this one... This one came you? later, and I'll think of its name right away. I, I've got the thing written down. Um, and there was an American major a, uh, who was in charge of medical denazification. And Abe said, this is the man who's been blocking it. He will not release a hospital to become purely a Jewish hospital. I and I was uh, Dr. Linick, Marvin Linick, L-I-N-I-C-K, uh, whom you should talk to, by the way. Right here. He's right here in New York. <laughs> He's a great source of information because he has an entirely different story. But he, he would, he's a very good source of information. ICK, and he's at 171 uh, West 57th Street, and I'll give you this phone number if you want. Uh, he's a great friend of Abe Klausner's, so I have no trouble really? getting to him. Yes. You mean after this? To me. 
uh, no, uh, I was already at that point in Nuremberg, and Abe called me and said, uh, come on down to Munich, you're our last hope, see if you can go out and get the hospital. I mean, the details don't matter, but I did go no, I'm out. I'm interested in the details. Well, these aren't details that specifically relate to but for a chapter. for historical purposes, we're interested uh, in everything. Uh, and Linick will give it all to you. Well, this is part well, of the story that can't be told. But I did go out to see. No story in terms of uh, I did go out to see this major. The major turned out to be Major Marvin Linick, uh, with whom I became friends enough so that he uh, said, "Come out and have dinner with me." Uh, I don't think this should be on the record about the ambulance. They're sure. part of it that should not be on the record. Well, it'll be uh, off the record, but tell it. Well, uh, anyway, I don't even want it on tape, it on tape uh, because there was a, another incident involved in it. But in any case, I went with him to his home, had dinner with him. By the end of the evening, I had the hospital. Uh, his one proviso was that he didn't want it to be a Jewish hospital. He wanted it to be an anti-fascist hospital which was fine with me because I was ready to take the hospital under any condition, and I knew that once we had an anti-fascist hospital, it would automatically become an all-Jewish hospital, which is exactly what happened. Uh, and there were, <coughs> incidentally, very valid reasons why we wanted a Jewish hospital, since our, uh, A, we had need to place our own Jewish doctors, of whom we had a goodly number already. Jewish doctors from DPs. the Army or DPs? No, 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 DPs our own DP doctors, and um, uh, by the way, there's the one doctor who became head of it, who's oh, here yeah. in New York, whom you should see, Dr. Pesachovich, if his name hasn't been given to you yet. Oh, Zalman. Zalman Greenberg, I'm sure you've seen already, or you know. Seen. I don't know where he is. He's well, out on the island. Seaport, Long Island. Seaport, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been there now, it's several years since we heard him there. Well, he still should be out on oh, yeah. the island. He can be listed. Yeah, yeah. All right. it's no Dr. problem. Dr. Pesach? Pesachovich, and I'm not sure I know how the name is spelled, but I can look that up. I can okay. get it for him. Okay, fine. Um, Abe Hyman would know, because I, th I know he was planning to see him. I'd suggest he was planning. He lives right here on, um, in the Lincoln Center uh, housing well, complex. Well. <laughs> but um, uh, also our people, our own Jewish DPs, who had tremendous fear of being approached by... Uh, a non-Jewish doctor, mm -hmm. and by a German doctor, who were the only ones that were manning the hospitals, where um, an injection, of course, was a frightfully, uh, uh, you know, was a very fearful, very frightening experience for them. So that we had, there was valid need for a Jewish hospital, but I was able to get it. Marvin Linick, when you see him, will fill you in on all that, yeah, but I, except I, I, the part that is none for the record. Okay. Um, was there anything else you wanted to tell me about that specific hospital? No, no, it was just an example of uh, where Abe specifically asked me to do something. I think it's very, very difficult to separate in incidents as such. The work was so overwhelming on so many different levels, and it went on all the time. Everybody, you just dug in and did whatever you could, when you could, how you could, uh, with whomever you could, uh, 20 hours out of the day. Yeah, but I'm...